Okay, I received, I you know, 187. I have no idea how many over the last few years people telling me, well, Ray, you don't think there's a hell. Okay, you, you need to read this 23 minutes of them. You really need to read this. This will prove it to you. Once you read this, Ray, you would be no doubt in your mind anymore that there's a hell and it's real and it's... Uh, you need to read this. Please, please, Ray. I beg you, please. Re- well, after... Uh, so many of these over the years, I finally decided, all right, I'll read it. So I, I put 23 minutes in hell in my computer and did a search. And, of course, I think there's like, I don't know, 6 million. I don't know, I can see this. <laughs> Unbelievable. But, I mean, they, all, they don't all have to do with this article, but uh, there's just so many of them. It's all over the Internet. And uh, so I, I copied one copy off, and I listened to one tape, one video of him giving his talk to a church. And then I copied this, and what I read didn't seem to fit with what I heard on the video. And then, so I found out there's several videos, so I watched a couple more this past week, or four days, or however long I've been doing this. And then I watched some interviews of this uh, Bill Weiss, on different shows, you know, Christian ministers and stuff who interviewed him about his 23 minutes in hell and so on and so forth. And uh, I'll just say this. The man contradicts himself and lies all over the place. It's just disgusting. I mean, this is really disgusting junk. I cannot even conceive that anybody with normal intelligence and IQ would read this and believe it. Do you remember that section I did on the seven Spanish kids who Christ gave a personal tour through hell, you know, and where this woman was in the mud and then she had to go back down under the mud and and her sin was she uh, she liked to wear makeup and she was too worldly and then there was this place where they, they had shoes and, and they had six inch spikes coming up inside the shoe and they had to jump they had to jump up and down they had to dance and jump on these spikes coming up their feet and all that you know and, and you know that thing is all over the internet there are millions of people who saw that and, and believe it now I know I mean I just poked fun at it you know it's just a stupid spoof you know people take it seriously millions of people believe that junk well, anyway, here's 23 Minutes in Hell by Bill Weiss. He has this demon-looking thing on the front, you know, and he, he said he saw a thing where, where Ken Hagen, oh, now there's, there's a true biblical scholar for you. Hagen. Yeah, he's the one that hisses like snakes and just bizarre garbage. Anyway, but he said he saw what the artist's rendition of a a, a (coughs) demon that Hagen had seen. This was years ago. He said, that is the demon I saw. That is the exact same demon. Now this guy, I don't know how old he is. He looks like he's in his 40s and he's got a lovely wife. And when you listen to him, you know, he just looks like such a nice guy. He seems very... Uh, uh, personable, you know, it seems like he'd be an honest guy. Guy, in my opinion, everything I say in this, in my opinion, except where I show you the facts, the guy is a two-faced lying hypocrite. He can't keep his story straight. He's only got 23 minutes to report on. He's been rehearsing it in his mind since 1998, 10 years. Well, the videos I got were in 06, I guess. But anyway, for eight years, he's been rehearsing these 23 minutes, and he can't keep it straight. He adds, he takes away, he contradicts himself over and over and over again. It's nonsense. All right. So anyway, he says he's going to answer in this thing, is hell a literal burning place? Where is hell? Do we have a body in hell? Are there degrees of punishment in hell? Are children in hell? Before the, he actually speaks, it, there's a couple of quotations. It says, hell is probably much worse than depicted in this testimony by Bill Weiss. Now you think about that as we go through. Much worse. Much worse. Not just worse. 
12,000 degrees inside the lake of fire. He never actually went in the lake of fire, but where he was, it was 300 degrees. You know, you can cook a turkey pretty fast with that. But in the real fire, 12,000 degrees. Okay? But this is what he says in depict. Hell is really much worse than that. Much worse than that. God's wrath for disobedience are infinite and eternal. He has a scripture on that. John 3, 36. Let's read it. And he that believes on the Son of Man has everlasting life. And he, he that believes on the Son of Man has not seen life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Excuse me, but does it say that, that the wrath of God abides on him eternally? It doesn't even have it. Aeon or Aeonius there. But that's the scripture he gave us. Lying turkey. Ephesians 5, 6. The punishments of God. No, God's wrath for disobedience are infinite. That means there is no end to the magnitude of the punishment. And there's no end. Ephesians 5, 6. Let no man deceive you with... Vain words, for because of these things comes the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Where does that say that's infinite and eternal? You all got a Bible? Ephesians 5, 6, read it. Deceitful people. Unbelievable. Anyway, the announcer in introducing Bill says, you're going to hear the vision of hell. You're going to hear the vision of hell. But even more important, you're going to hear a, a, a vision of intimacy with Jesus Christ and the love he has for the world. Bill was in hell. But he wasn't a casual observer, as so many people have been in, in legitimate visions. But he experienced the torments of hell for about a half an hour with absolutely no hope of ever escaping. Bill and his wife are deeply converted to Jesus Christ and to the work of God and so on and so forth. So Bill says, it's an honor to be here and so on. And he says, we don't do this for the money. What? We don't do this for the money? Let me see here. Christianity Today. Now you know that's probably the most prestigious Christian magazine on the face of the earth. Sales of these books are boosted by uh, the author's speaking engagements. Published March 7th of this year, 23 Minutes in Hell has sold 54,000 copies. That's, that's a, right when it was published. But according to Ravel, publisher of 90 Minutes in Hell, the book... Speaking of the, the book 23 Minutes in Hell, it re- released in September 04, and Revell estimated the first year's sale would be less than 10,000. Publicity for the book was limited to a half page in a Christian magazine, but according to the publicist, it since has taken off, and now more than 800,000 are in print. Okay, More than 500,000 sold in 2005. Well, we're up in 2000. Eight now, okay? So we've added 06, 07, 08, and we're at 800,000. How many millions of this copy to this piece of trash do you suppose have been sold by now? They sell it for real money. And it's like 102 pages, which hardly qualifies as a book. It's a, it's a, it's a brochure, you know? He says, but first I want to address a couple of things. Some question in your mind, the first question comes to your mind, after listening to me, would be, how do you know it wasn't just a, a dream that you had? A bad dream. A couple of points to make. First of all, I had left my body. I saw my body when I returned lying on the floor. So I know for sure that it was an out-of-body experience. See, whatever you dream, you can tell for sure what's going on by what's in the dream. Because you know that everything in a dream is literally true, don't you? I mean, you all know that, don't you? Everything you've ever dreamed is literally true. 
Have you ever dreamed that you could fly? How many have ever dreamed that you could fly? I have. Can we literally fly without an airplane? Can we? Well, but if you dreamed it, it's true. That's proof. But I don't even know what to think about people who write like this. I dreamed it, therefore it must be true. Then he quotes uh, Job 7.14. Thou scareth me with dreams and terrifies me with visions. So this is definitely what the Lord did. He terrified me through a vision. He said it was not a dream. He terrified me through a vision, you see. Well, the terrified and the scared in the Hebrew mean exactly the same thing. It means to make you afraid. They both mean exactly the same. But he said, yeah, but I like the one that says visions. See, it's nonsense. Every scripture he gives has nothing to do with what he's talking about. Absolutely nothing. And he has like 20, 30, 40 of them or whatever. They have nothing to do whatsoever. Then he asks his wife to come up. And uh, she only really understood what was taking place when he returned. So she's going to let us know, you know, that, that Bill was not making this up. So his wife says, it was about 323. Hence, the title of the paper, 23 Minutes in Hell. And notice it. When I woke up, it was 323 in the morning when I woke up. I just remember that because I looked at the digital clock said 323. What does that have to do with the title of this book that he, and, and which is just stated over and over by millions of times, that he was in hell for, what does that have to do with it? The fact that it was 323. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And then I'll comment on that again. This It was 323. And I noticed Bill was not next to me, and I heard screaming coming from the, our living room. I proceeded to go down the hallway. I found my husband in a way I'd never seen him before. If anyone gets to know Bill, he is a conservative man by nature, very calm and a professional man. He's just not the type to get excited to get real emotional over anything, unless it's God, God at times. But anyway, I saw him there, traumatized. Pay attention to these words. Don't forget these words. How did she find him? Traumatized. Literally traumatized. Don't forget those words. We're coming back to that. We're going to come back to that. Maybe they think everybody only looks at one of his videos. I looked at as many as I could stand. And trust me, they all contradict. Traumatized, holding his skull. I guess that would be like his head. Between his hands and crying out and screaming. He was in a fetal position lying on the floor. I didn't know what to do. I thought he was having a heart attack. I just started to pray and he cried out and said, Pray the Lord will take this out of my mind. The Lord took me to hell. I feel my body is dying. I can't handle this. Remember these words. We're coming back to that. So I proceeded to pray for him, and in about ten minutes, uh, he began to calm down. He was literally in a traumatized state. Like someone who went to Vietnam and had a reoccurrence and all that. So I just wanted to testify to that. Now, on page 16, I'm getting ahead of myself, but on page 16, we read this. Right then, when he, Jesus left, that's when all the fear, the torture, and the torment came back into my mind. This was when Christ brought him back to his home out of hell. When Christ departed then, all this fear and trauma came back into his mind. Because it says in the Bible, 1 John 4:18, perfect love casts out fear. So I was next to perfect love all that time, so that left me. And when he left, all of a sudden, all the fear and horrors 
of hell entered my mind. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it. I was screaming. I was in agony. I couldn't live with it. I knew that this body was not capable of withstanding that kind of fear. Now, this is after he brought back in the Lord Lives, right? You can't hold up under that kind of pressure. Your body isn't strong enough. So that's when I prayed and was able to pray, take it out of my mind. In the natural, you would have to go through all kinds of counseling to get through this kind of trauma. But God took it out instantly. Instantly took it out, the trauma. He left the memory, but he took the trauma and the fear out. Huh? And then his wife finds him and what? Totally traumatized. Totally traumatized. She said it took him ten, ten minutes she's praying, just to calm him down a little bit. The Lord took it all away and there was no more trauma. Now that's a blatant contradiction, if not a lie. In video number one, this isn't on this one. I had to put some bits and pieces together from other ones. She left an important part out here. In one of the videos, his wife said, after she calmed him down, you know, by praying over him, because he was so traumatized, but he said he wasn't traumatized because he prayed himself and God took it all away. Lying turkey. In video one, she said, after she calmed him down, he ran to the kitchen and grabbed a glass of water. And everybody laughs in the video. Oh, it was so funny. He thought he was in hell. He had to have a glass of water. Did you catch that? He ran to the kitchen and grabbed a glass of water. But in another video where his wife was up there giving the same account, she says, one of the first things, this is after she prayed for him and calmed him down, one of the first things he asked for was a glass of water. And I got that for him. And he calmed down and told me what happened to him. How stupid do these people think Christians are? Pretty stupid. I mean, they really do. And the fact of the matter is, they do believe it. I mean, they do believe it. This thing is all over the Internet like you wouldn't believe this whole episode took only supposedly 23 minutes. So it, it was such a traumatized. You kind of remember what, what this stuff was. And certainly you don't tell it once and twice and three times. And then all of a sudden the story changes. The demons change and the episodes change and the chronological order changes. You know, he wanted a glass of water, so I went and I got him a glass of water. No, he got up and ran to the kitchen and, and grabbed the glass of water. These are two different things. Now, how can you believe anybody who claims to be a Christian and is a blatant liar? In my estimation, if I want to, you know, I'm seeing here, okay. Got to cover myself because these Christians will sue you. So anyway, y'all, y'all caught that contradiction there, didn't you? He was... He prayed to God. He took all the trauma away. His wife finds him. He's totally traumatized. And he wants a glass of water. So she goes, and I got him a glass of water. And she said, he got up and he ran to the kitchen and grabbed the glass of water. You say, oh, Ray, what's the difference? The difference is they know they're not telling the same story. They're making it up as they go. I'm so blessed to have a good woman, he says, and so on. I wanted to find out, I wanted to find out when got back from this. This is the way this whole thing is written. It's the most broken, juvenile, second grade grammar you have ever heard. I wanted to find out when got back from this experience. If there's anybody in the Bible who ever experienced hell. So I began to research. I listened to Chuck Misler a lot. He's a Bible teacher across the nation, a real scholar. Well, there's Happy's problem right there. You know, you listen to these people and, and you start to believe anything. And uh, it says in Jonah, quote, in hell he cried out. Jonah 2 2. It's Sheol. The word is Sheol. It's not hell. It's Sheol. There's not the Christian hell. Back in the Old Testament, Hebrew, there were no Christians. There was no Christian hell. 
This is Sheol, which is the state of the dead. Because Jonah felt like he was dead, dying and dead, like he was entering Sheol when he was inside this fish. Then he says the earth with her bars was about me and so on. So at least there was somebody in the Bible who experienced hell. Jonah, well, there you have it. There's your scripture proof. He said, I found over 400 scriptures that depicted everything I saw, heard, felt, and so on. Over 400. I can quote all 400. He says, even small. So, to get into it quickly, my wife and I were at Sunday prayer meeting, as we always attend it with our pastor, and we went home like any normal people. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I was taken. I did not know how I got there until I returned. So the title of this book and this article and all these videos is 23 Minutes in Hell. Now, where did that 23 minutes come from? Well, here he says, at 3 o'clock in the morning he was taken. This is our first clue. When was he taken? 3 o'clock in the morning. At what time did his wife say she saw an alarm clock when she woke up? 323. There's your 23 minutes. Oops. Oops. At another place, in another video, he says, they went to bed, they came home from the prayer meeting, went to bed at 11 p.m. And sometimes between 11 and 3, it happened. But then in another video, it says, it was sometime between midnight and 3 o'clock. But then in another video, it says, it was between 2 and 3 o'clock. (laughs) <laughs> picky, picky, picky. <laughs> picky, picky. <laughs> but I was just dropped into a prison cell, just like a regular prison cell, like you imagine, with rough stones and walls and bars in the door. I didn't know where I was. All I knew, that I was extremely hot, terribly hot. Now, You read in the introduction where it says that he had been a Christian for 15 or 16 years or something, okay? Now, how is it in 15 or 16 years of belonging to these uh, Pentecostal-type churches where they talk fire, hell, and brimstone? How is it he didn't know what hell was? How was it he's in this hot place and he doesn't know that they have a teaching about hell where it's hot and there's fire and demons? How is that? All I knew that it was extremely hot. I don't know where I was. It was hot. Couldn't believe I was alive. I uh, felt like I should have disintegrated with the heat, but I was still alive. It was light in the room for a little while, and I believe the Lord's presence was there for me to see the scenery better. (laughs) Scenery? This guy, he really does write like a third grader. Anyway, God, Christ wanted to let him see the scenery. But then it went dark again. And in Isaiah 24, 22, he says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in prison. There it is. He's got scriptural proof that that's how it is. Because there's a scripture on being in prison. And Proverbs, they shall go down the hell in the chambers of death. By chambers it means rooms. So the hell has has prison cells, chambers, pits of fire, and big areas of fire. So I was just in a prison cell at this time. He gives two more scriptures. Just total, out of context nonsense. I find myself in the cell, and these four creatures were in the cell with me. But in the first, in almost all the other videos, he's two. It was only two. Later on he said there was four, but it's only two. But here, how was it? It was four. Okay. I didn't realize they were demons. Why not? I mean, if that's what your teach, church has been teaching you all these years, if you didn't know they were demons, how is somebody never went to church and they go to hell supposed to know what's going on here? Everything about these demons, they were twisted. They were deformed and twisted and out of proportion, out of symmetry. No symmetry. <laughs> you 
imagine that. They had no cemetery, you know. Imagine that. Demons with no cemetery. That's my comment there in the end. That's not out there. <laughs> they had no cemetery. <laughs> And they were blaspheming God. The whole while they were cursing God. I wondered, why are they cursing God? Why are they hating God so much? In hell, your senses are keener. You are just aware of more than our physical bodies are. Your physical body isn't aware of anything. It's your mind, not your body. You know, my hand is not aware of what's going on today. It's my mind. I was aware of distance, I was aware of time, and so forth. Much more than you are here. I knew these things, were uh, these things, meaning these demons, were assigned to me to torture me forever in this place. And he shows he show a picture of his, this, I don't know what it is, this red, gnarly-faced, ugly demon. I was aware that I had no strength. I was hopelessly lying there. One demon just grabbed me and picked me up and threw me into the wall like a glass. He just picked me up like a glass. That was how light I was and how strong he was. And he threw me into the wall and every bone in my body broke. And I felt pain. Well, duh, I would think so. I just began to lie on the floor there. I just began to lie there. I thought he threw you there. I just began to lie there. What is that? I mean, you know, if this were a third grader, he would get a low mark for really bad grammar. I just began to lie there. No, you didn't begin to lie there. You were thrown there with all your bones broken, crying out for mercy. But these creatures don't have any mercy at all. Absolutely no mercy. The one picked me up, and the other one, with his razor-sharp claws, he just shredded my flesh right off. He just tore it off. And had absolutely no care whatsoever for this body that God so wonderfully made. (laughs) The writing is so bizarre. I mean, interjects these thoughts at a time when it's like, what? In another version... I don't know why he left it out in this one, but in another version, in fact, the first version that I watched, a video of him, he said this demon uh, grabbed him and ripped the flesh off of him. And then he said, but in 30 seconds, about 30 seconds, it grew back. And guess what? He ripped it off again. So every 30 seconds your flesh will die. And every 30 seconds he rips all the flesh off your body. But what did we read up front here? Let me check that again. What did we read up here? Hell is probably much worse than depicted in this testimony. Much worse. You have your, all your flesh torn off of your body every 30 seconds for all eternity. But real hell is much worse than that. <laughs> I mean, what, what, what are we to say to something like this? If, if this were some piece of junk that some kid wrote, you know, just to be funny, in uh, you know, for a creative writing class or something, this is believed by millions of people. People email me a link to this junk continually, nonstop. Ripped my flesh off. And the other one said, ripped it off, ripped it off. And he said, and I knew he would keep ripping it off for all eternity. It had a hatred that was so intense. I wondered, why why am I alive, you know? I don't understand why I'm not dead. My flesh just hung there. There was no blood, just flesh hanging, because life is in the blood and there is no life in hell. Life, no, 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 no. Back in Leviticus, that verse does not say the life is in the blood. That the soul is in the blood. It's not life. But the Christian church will keep quoting that wrong, just like, you know, the strain at and that. You know, I mean, they'll never correct that in a million years. There's no life in hell. 
Okay. So what do you say? His body has no life in it. If it has no life in it, has no blood, he didn't bleed when he ripped the flesh off because the, the life is in the blood and there was no blood. So there's no, there is no life in hell. How is he alive then? What kind of dictionary nonsense is this? How did he feel pain if he wasn't alive? There's no life in hell. And, he says, and, there's no life in hell. And, guess what? And, there's no water in hell. (laughs) It's like, he's describing all this stuff, you know, and it's so ugly and horrendous and it's just so miserable and evil looking and, and, and then he says and, and, and it wasn't pretty to look at either <laughs> or some dumb thing I mean, this is just, you can't get dumber than this <laughs> well yeah I mean, I mean they, people believe it they send it to me then, then he quotes the scripture and so you know how, how how weak we are, you know, in Isaiah. And we know that the devil does have strength in the scriptures. There there was a demon man running around and so on, and they came by the seaside and everything, and this, this man was very strong, so. He says, uh, and that was just a man with demonic strength. I understood that these demons have about 1,000 times the strength of a man. He said, demons run your life in hell. Oh, really? Over here in, uh, let's see, I, I get it ahead of myself sometimes just to, to show you the contradictions because I'll, I'll come to this again anyway but he, he gives the scripture there in Matthew 25 where it says uh, you know hell was made for the devil and his angels Okay. excuse me but if hell was made for the devil and his demons how come the demons are torturing the hell out of these humans and ain't nobody doing anything bad to the demons See, these people think that nobody's smart enough to think about things like that. All the while it's these demons doing all these nasty things to humanity. I thought he just read a scripture, this whole place was made for the demons. Who's torturing the demons? How did they get that all screwed up and backwards? Now the demons are having all the fun torturing humanity, but but he says it was made for the demons. He never intended for humans to go there. Demons were supposed to be tortured there for all eternity. Then why aren't they being tortured? Why are they having all the fun torturing human beings? Does anybody ever ask these questions in an Orthodox church? No, never! Would never enter their mind to ask ask something as simple or logical as that. There is no logic in the Orthodox religion. It's all nonsense, unscriptural nonsense, all of it. Well, you believe Christ died for your sins, don't you? Yes, of course I do. You don't. You Orthodox Christians don't believe it. You think when he was supposed to die for our sins, he was in hell. It's what they all teach in the Orthodox Church. Yeah, I believe Christ died for our sins. They don't. The Christian Church doesn't. They think the Savior of the world is a cadaver. And boy, do they hate me for talking like this. Ask me if I care. The smell of these demons and the smell of hell is so atrocious. He thought it was so bad. He he thought it should kill him, but it, it didn't. It didn't. And he, he talks about the profanity, you know, talking with all this evil profanity. They were cursing God. And this is mentioned in Ezekiel twenty two twenty six. he says. In Ezekiel twenty two twenty six says, I was profaned 
among them. Then he, he puts the scripture here. I can't believe he did, but he did. Her priests have violated my law and profaned my holy things, and they have not distinguished themselves, and so on and so forth. He says, I am profaned among them. Okay? Now, who is he talking about here? Is he talking about devils and demons and, and wicked people in hell profane? Is that what the context of Ezekiel 22 is? No. The context of Ezekiel 22 is the abominations of the Jews in Jerusalem. And you know what these Orthodox Christians have to say about how we should think about the Jews in Jerusalem. Regardless of what the rest of the book of Ezekiel has to say about Jerusalem and what a pitiful, disgusting place it was and will be. Up until one, when? How long is Jerusalem going to be this rotten stench in God's nostrils? How long? When will it change? Well, partly right, yes. But Ezekiel says, when Sodom is, is, is restored, <laughs> when Sodom is restored, he likens the Jews in Jerusalem being worse than Sodom. That's who it's talking about in Ezekiel 22. Not demons and people in hell. I mean, it's right there. Her priests have violated my law. The first, the first words of the sentence. Who's this talking about? The priests, the Jewish priests in Jerusalem. Not the demons in hell. Who profaned him? The Jewish priests in Jerusalem, not the demons in hell. Deceitful people. What a crock. What a crock this is. People, people just, like, this is such a wonderful revelation. This is evil filth. Then he goes on to say, that was what they did to the Jewish people. That was in the natural. But where did they get the idea from? And he talks about how the Jews are mistreated. Where did they get the idea how to mistreat Jews? From hell. <laughs> from hell. There's what the demons do. And the mercy? There's only mercy in heaven. The devils have no knowledge of any kind of mercy. God has made mankind the highest form of creation, and these demons are the lowest form of creation. As men, we work hard to get ahead in life. We bet to better ourselves. We study. But in hell, your life is run by demons. These creatures have a zero IQ. Zero. Absolute ignorant creatures. All they know is hatred for God, hatred for you, and torture. I would think that would take a little IQ, don't you think? Oh, maybe like six or seven. No, they got zero IQ. He knew that. And they run your life. And you, and you can't do anything about it. Let me give some more scriptures. Everything just totally out of context. And on and on it goes, he says. That was a terrible thing. To have your life run by these creatures. They have no mercy for you whatsoever. How is it the demons are running things in hell? I thought it was made for them. And now they're running things. And they run your life. So isn't that a giant twist of what, what they would have you think that hell was made for Satan and these angels would represent? People are screaming all over the place. There were millions. I knew there were uh, billions. I knew they were billions. And it, it was so loud. Well, I, I bet. You know, a billion people screaming probably would be pretty loud. If you ever heard someone scream before, it can be annoying. Well, if you hear billions of people screaming, you can't imagine how it affects your mind. You just can't stand it. You hold your ears because it's loud and penetrating. You can't get away from the screams. And the fear is unbelievable. 
Everything is dominated by fear. There's no presence of God in this place. So you have to endure the fear and the torment and the blackness. You can't see anything. You can't even see what is coming up against you. But then he goes on, page after page after page, explaining what he saw in hell. You can't see anything. But because I saw this and I saw that, and he, you know, he had claws, and this one had had these razor sharp dorsal fins, and all this. But you can't see anything. The fear, I got to tell you, was so powerful. It grips you. If you have ever seen some scary movie where where the fear jumps up in your throat, it can take that and multiply it by at least a thousand and hold it there. <clears throat> that that is how you stay all the time. And I know something about fear. When I was young, I used to surf. When I was really young, we were in Cocoa, Florida. I think he means Cocoa Beach, surfing, uh, and and there was a school, parentheses, a group. <laughs> Excuse me, but I just, I just find it comical, you know, <laughs> the way it is, you're right, it's like a, like a third grader. There was a school, in front, a group of sharks coming around us, and a nine-foot tiger shark, I guess he... He had his tape measure with him, and he said, Now, hold it, stretch out there, Mr. Shark. Let me get, get this head. To, yeah, nine feet. Nine feet shark came up, and he bit my board right in half. And I'm thinking to myself, why don't I believe that? You know, a nine-foot shark is about from here to the wall, Okay. Now imagine that, and that that means he's fairly slender, you know, nine feet. You get up 12, 14 feet, they get pretty chubby, you know. But he bit his, his uh, surfboard right in half. I have seen surfboards that are made out of, I guess, some kind of styrofoam or something. I have seen them where a shark took a bite out of the side. You know, you could see his teeth marks, like a little half-moon circle, actually did bite a piece out of the side of a surfboard. I have seen that already, okay? But why don't I believe a nine-foot shark can bite a surfboard right in half? Huh? Does anybody believe that's possible? Does anybody believe this man is telling the truth? I know something about fear. And it grabbed me by the leg and pulled me down. So my leg was in the mouth of this giant shark, nine feet. Giant shark. I wasn't a Christian then. It was before I was even saved. And all of a sudden, it let me go. I know God opened the shark's mouth. But for a few moments, the fear that comes into you is absolute overwhelming. Absolute overwhelming. We didn't know what adverbs are, but that's okay. If anybody ever saw Jaws, that fear was nothing compared to actually going through it. The fear was terrifying. The guy next to me was just a couple of feet away, and the shark ripped his leg right off. It's in the book. (laughs) Ripped his leg right off, and they dragged him up on the beach, and blood was everywhere. I said, I guess I could imagine. And he was screaming. He had no leg. I can't tell you how much I don't believe that story. A nine-foot shark bites a surfboard in half, and then it bites his leg, takes him under, but then lets him go and bites off his buddy's leg, bites it clean off. No, I don't think he bit it off. It said he ripped it off. I don't think he ripped it off. Yeah, he, he ripped it off. The shark ripped off his right leg. Now... Being the devious type person that I am, 
I said, yeah, I, I don't believe that for one second. I think I would bet most of it, all that I own that that story is not true. So I got on the phone and I called, I called Coco Beach, and I wanted to talk to the. I, I, I at first I, I talked to somebody at the uh, at the uh, Chamber of Commerce, and I asked him. I said, "Has anybody been there a long time? Does anybody know? Like maybe 15 years ago or whatever." Uh, 20 years ago, it, it, there's somebody on the beach there that a shark bit a surfboard right in half and then ripped the man's leg off. Does anybody? Well, no, but nobody. One person asked him, said, no, I, nobody knows that. They said, maybe you should check with the Parks and Recreation Commission or something for the area. So I called them and nobody answered. But anyway, I tried. Okay, And, and I probably this week, I, I will spend a little more time. And uh, if I'm wrong on this, and they tell me, yes, yes, so many years ago, there was a, a boy here, and a, and a nine-foot shark bit his surfboard right in half, and then the buddy that was next to him ripped his leg right off. So I'm, I'm sure that's in the local newspapers and everything. You know, you could look that up at the library. Does anybody want to bet me that there's no such story in the Cocoa Beach Library? I just. I'll apologize if I'm wrong about that. But you couldn't make the. You couldn't make me believe that story at the end of a 357 Magnum. I I was now outside the cell. I looked in this direction and I looked that way. I could see. I could see. What do you mean I could see? Didn't he just tell us you can't see in hell? Didn't he say it's so dark you can't see anything in hell? Didn't he just say I could see? I looked and I could see. Picky, picky. There were flames of fire about ten miles away. I knew it was ten miles. He had his global positioning satellite monitor or whatever with him. And a pit of fire that was about three miles across had flames that uh, lit up the skyline. The skyline? <laughs> the skyline? <laughs> Enough to see the landscape. The landscape and the skyline. He, he's, in, he's in the middle of the earth. 4,000 feet, three, 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 no, he said 3,700, 3,700 feet in the middle of the earth where the temperature is 12,000 degrees, and he can see the skyline. <laughs> what sky? There's no sky in the middle of the earth. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> The darkness was so heavy, it just eats up the light. But there was enough that I could see some of the skyline. <laughs> Black sky and smog was in the skylight. <laughs> we got a skyline. We got scenery. <laughs> you can see the scenery. Skylight. We got the landscape. And, and now we got skylight. There ain't no sky. There ain't no light. <laughs> oh, man. Flames were really high, so I could see it. Well, I guess if the flames were really high. There is no life whatsoever in hell. I know you already told us that. <laughs> now are all these people living, but anyway, everybody's alive. Nobody's dead there. They're all alive, but there's no life in hell. So strange in a world where there's no life. The heat was intense. And he quotes Deuteronomy 32, they shall be burnt with hunger. <laughs> he quotes Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah is not in hell. That's what's going on in hell. It is so hot. All these things should kill you, but you don't die. You had to keep enduring all these things. I wanted peace of mind to get away from the screams and to get out of there. It's like when you want to go home at night when you had a rough day. <laughs> Am I the only one who thinks this is funny? <laughs> I think this is hilarious. 
The only pathetic part is that people believe it. This is good comedy stuff. People believe it. And it frightens little children. Damnable heresy to these people. Anyway, yeah, I guess it would be like a rough day in the office. You're also naked in hell. It's just another thing you have to endure. Shame. He gives another scripture on that. Uh, and, and Job 26, 6, Sheol is naked before him. That's proof that you're naked in hell because it says in, in Job, Sheol is naked before him. That means God can see into hell, so it is, it is observable to him. No kidding. I wonder how he does that. It's observable to God. He can see it. He, it's in the book. He says he can. But also, you're naked in hell. Just another thing you have to go through, he says. There is no water in hell at all, no water. There's no humidity in the air and no water of any kind. It's so dry, you are desperate for a drop of water, just one. Just like the scripture says in Luke 16:23. <laughs> he says, if you can imagine running a marathon through Death Valley and having cotton in your mouth, and, and just stay that way for days. And that's how it is in hell. No water. But he talks about Lazarus in hell, and uh, he says Did he just wanted a drop. I think it's so funny. You know, it says there's a gulf, and it says in the King James, those that would want to come over here can't, and those that would want to come over to you can't. That's not what it says in the Greek. It says ferry. Those who would ferry over. This gulf is filled with water. You can't ferry over a desert. You ferry with a ferry boat. There's water there. I covered that in my that when I went through. Oh no, I got that uh, whole article on Lazarus and the rich man. Anyway, so he says there's a great gulf that was revealed to me in hell between paradise and Hades. And the rich man saw Abraham afar off. In the natural, how could he recognize Lazarus and Abraham? First of all, he never met Abraham. And then to see someone that far away, you wouldn't really know who who they were. But there are just certain things you know in hell. You understand. Do you, do you remember a few minutes ago where we read where he didn't understand where he was or why he was there or what was going on? He didn't understand. Then he says and told us, hey, you understand so much more than you do here. You see? Then he says, you don't understand. Then he says, you do understand. Well, which is it? Well, he just has trouble keep sticking to one story. Then one of the demons grabbed me and drug me back into the cell and began all these torments again, which I really hate to talk about because I don't like to have to relive the torment. They began to crush my skull. One demon grabbed me and tried to crush my head. I was screaming and begging for mercy, but no mercy. Uh, About that time, each grabbed an arm and a leg, and they were about to tear off my arms and my legs. I thought, I can't endure this. I can't endure this. And all of a sudden, something grabbed me and pulled me out of the cell. I don't, I, I know it was the Lord, but then I didn't know. What? At another point, Christ comes on the scene and he said, it's the Lord. He said he was so bright, you know, he was so bright. And here he pulls him out of the cell and he's so dull. The Lord is so dull, he can't see him. He knew it was the Lord, but he couldn't see him because he was he turned from light to dark. Even though the scriptures tell us in him there's no darkness at all. Now you want a scripture? I'll give you a scripture. In him there's no darkness at all. Yet this Jesus pulling him out of the cell was so dark he couldn't see him. Now who's the liar? I knew it was the Lord, but then I didn't know that. Why wouldn't you know it? If you knew it another time when he comes on the scene... Well, this may even be the same time, come to think of it. So one place he says he was so bright, 
And he just instantly knew it was the Lord and he fell down. And here he didn't know it was the Lord. I was there as an unsaved person, so I didn't know these things. But you got all this perception. You know so much. You just know things you would never know here. And here he was a Christian for 15 years. He had no idea who the Lord is. Does anybody think this man tells the truth ever? My opinion. I just was there as if I never accepted the Lord. I was placed there next to the fire then. I don't know if I commented on it earlier. I think he said that he was taken to hell as an unsaved person. That he didn't know when he was in hell that he was actually a saved person. He accepted the Lord and was uh, got the uh, baptism of the Holy Gully or whatever and was a saved person. He didn't know that, he said, because God took it away from him. What? God is deceitful? God, take a person who believes in Jesus Christ and take it out of your mind and make you think you're a sinner and don't know Jesus? God would do that? Well, his God would. He said so. Anyway. Alongside the fire, I could see through the flames just enough to see the bodies. People in the fire screaming, screaming for mercy, burning in this place. And I knew I didn't want to go there. Uh, The pain I'd endure already had bad enough, but the heat of those flames, well, that was worse. These people were begging to come out. There were big creatures lined up all along the edge of the pit. And as the people crawled up trying to get out, they would be shoved back into the fire and allowed not allowed out. I thought, oh, this place is so horrible, so horrible, uh, and uh, horrendous. Horrendous too. Horrible, 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 and horrendous. All this is going on at the same time. You're thirsty, you're hungry, and you're exhausted. You don't get to sleep in hell either. You need sleep, just as we do now. Your body needs sleep, but you never get to sleep. Imagine how that is, never sleeping. Then he talks about all these monsters and demons and five-foot spiders and all this stuff in the cave and rats and snakes. In another one, he, he said, he said I, I really kind of hate to even mention this because people find it really hard to believe, he said, but there was one snake, he said, around the corner, as big as a train. Big as a train, he said. Then he quotes, And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in the everlasting chains under darkness for the judgment of the great day. So he saw these demons chained by the wall, and he said, i got a scripture on that. So, you know, talks about these angels that were chained to the wall. And then he says, And so maybe that's what I saw. I don't know. You don't know? He knows everything. He knows how many miles deep he is, for crying out loud. He knows everything. I don't know, but that that's what it appeared to me. Now, shall I tell you why he put that there? My estimation. Because probably, I'm thinking somebody coached him a little bit. They say, you know, take something where you saw these creatures chained to the wall, then give the scripture where it says these angels are chained, you know, until judgment. Give that scripture. And then say, I don't know, maybe that's what it was. I don't know. Because the people will be thinking in the back of their mind, well, yes, of course that's what it was. Yes, of course that's what it was. This is a psychological ploy to get the people on your side. Where you say, well, I'm not sure. And they say, well, yes, you, yes, he's sure. I can see it. I can see it. Yeah, that's exactly what it was. I see through all this stuff. Trust me, I see through it. I can spot these lying, two-faced hypocrites ten miles away in the dark. I was so glad they were chained to the wall. <laughs> I got. I put a comment here. Yes, I guess he was glad they were chained to the wall. If they weren't chained to the wall, they might rip his arms and legs off, or crush his skull, or break every bone in his body, or rip his flesh off over and over again every 30 seconds for all eternity. Yeah, he could be glad they were chained to the wall, all right. (laughs) Boy, 
boy, imagine what these would have done to him. They would have probably hurt him. The worst thing, worst, W-O-R-S-E, the worst thing in hell, the worst, W-O-R-S-E, worst thing again, worse, W-O-R-S-E, than all the torments. So you got one out of three right. <laughs> the worst thing, worse, not worst, was I understood that, first of all, that there was life going on up on the earth, and the people up there, most people, have no idea that this world even existed down here. What? Do the 90% of the people in America who believe in God and the 70-some percent who are Christians never go to church and they never teach them these things? What do you mean that they don't know? That's a pretty strong indictment against the church. Don't you reckon if they don't know? These people don't know? If they don't know up there, what do these people know down here? This is an admission that they don't even know where they are. He was here. Listen, he said, I was put there. Later, he said, Christ told him he was put there so he could experience hell like it really is. That's why he actually suffered the pain, and he didn't just see it like all these um, near-death experiences. Right? He actually experienced everything in hell. God wanted him to experience it. Well, he didn't know where he was. He didn't know that these were demons. And the people there, they don't know where they are either. Now, can you imagine that? God creates billions of human beings burns them in hell for all eternity and they don't even know where they are or why they're there. I tell you, we got a job. We have a job ahead of us. I wish we had some more people to help. We can reach a few people. I mean, we're reaching a few now, but not, not, not that many. I mean, do you even begin to understand what pathetic spiritual condition this country is in? Then the rest of the Christian world. It is just pathetic. They believe this junk. That God Almighty created humanity knowing he would torture most of them inhumanely, absolutely insanely. With such gross and abominable, disgusting things. If God made this place called hell, then in the heart and mind of God, He has got to have come up somewhere with all these damnable things that He's doing to humanity. This is the God they worship. I mean, this is pathetic. I mean, this is just a Bible study. This is disgusting. This is evil beyond comprehension. It doesn't get any worse than this. When, when intelligent, good-looking young people get up in front of one gr- crowd after another after another, and now he's going to go on a world tour. I read in one of the sites, I guess, where he's going to start. Nigeria? No. Paris? Ain't much to do, and ain't much nightlife, I guess, in Nigeria or whatever. My opinion, again, before you come out to sue me, Bill Weiss, my opinion, unbelievable. Most people, they have no idea this place exists. They don't even know this is a real down here. If they had an opportunity to get out, you know. But they never get a chance to get out. And being mad at themselves, you know, as for not taking the opportunity. It's all, it's all a matter of chance, you know. You know, he had a lucky break. To, you know, he didn't take an opportunity. You know, he had an opportunity. You know, he passed it up. And now you just burn in hell for all eternity and suffer these unspeakable evils. And if these people are down here, if they're up there and down here in hell, and they don't know where it is, and they don't know why they're there, and we know they, they were not sentenced or judged, well, they were sentenced, but they were not judged, because he already said that this hell is going to be cast into the lake of fire after judgment. So these people are suffering down here, these inhumane, horrible things, and they haven't even been uh, found guilty of anything. 
Boy, I just wish to God that one day after Hagee hey, got done, you know, giving his seven wonders to Haller, said, hey, well, give me 20 minutes on that pulpit. 20 minutes. Let me talk to the same congregation. And on the international television. I'll burn their ears. <laughs> You're right, I wouldn't last 20 minutes, but if God wanted it, I would. I mean, who, whose responsibility is it that the whole human race, or most of it, burning in hell, don't know where they are or why they're there? Whose responsibility do you suppose that might be? Who created these creatures? Satan? I mean, I think sometimes people think, you know, you get a little huffy, Ray. You know, you say these people despise the Word. They don't despise. They just don't quite see it. No, they despise the Word of God. And they blaspheme the name of God. You know, it says in Corinthians there, the name of God is blaspheme. Not, not, Not in some little church or some little satanic cult. Among the nations. That's where he's blasphemed. Among the nations. Jesus appears. About this time, I'm going up the tunnel, and I'm just in absolute fear, hopelessly lost, fearing these demons. All of a sudden, Jesus shows up. Praise the Lord. Jesus showed up. This bright light lit up the place. I only saw his outline, though the outline of a man. I couldn't see his face because it was so bright. I just collapsed on my knees and and, and I was so grateful. We already commented, you know, that, you know, did he know it was Jesus? Didn't he know it was Jesus? The first time he didn't know it was Jesus, but he thought it was Jesus? Nonsense. A second ago, I was lost forever. And now, all of a sudden, I'm out of this place because I had already known Jesus. Those people can't get out, but I could because I had already been saved. I knew and understood that there was no way out except by Jesus. He is the only way to keep from going to hell. When I got my composure, at least enough to start forming thoughts, I thought about saying to the Lord, I don't even think I said it out loud. He just understood it. And he said, why did you send me there? And he said, because people don't believe this place exists. He said, even some of my own people, oh, no, not some of his own people, do not believe this place is real. Can you believe that? Some Christians don't even believe this place he's describing is real. I was shocked at that statement. I thought every Christian has got to believe in hell. But not everyone believes in a literal burning hell. I said, Lord, why did you pick me? But he didn't answer. I have no idea why he picked me out. And he said, you know, that he he would have to to tell the people about it. And I thought to myself, but who's going to believe me? They're they're going to think I'm crazy. I had a bad dream. I mean, wouldn't you think? uh, I thought this Lord answered me and he said, it's not your job to convince them. It's the Holy Spirit's job. You just go and tell them. Then he asked, why did they hate these uh, demons, hate so much and so on, hate me? Lord, why do they hate me so much? Why did these creatures hate me? And he said, because you're made in my image and they hate me there it is so here's this man a Christian but he didn't know he was a Christian because God deceived him and made him think he was a sinner and he's in the image of God we know he's in the image of God how do we have proof that while he was in hell he was in the very image of God himself how do we know that how do we have proof of that Because Jesus Christ said that's why the demons hated you so much. Because you're in my image. If he was in the image of Jesus Christ, why would he be in hell being tortured? Unbelievable. Well, yeah, unbelievable. And then God flooded me with his thoughts. He let me touch a piece of his heart. Oh, how he loves mankind. Oh, really? 
Oh, really, this God of Bill Weiss loves mankind so much that he's going to have demons rip their flesh off, grow it back, rip it off again, grow it back, rip it off again every 30 seconds for all eternity in darkness, being thirsty and can't sleep in 12,000 degrees heat for all eternity. Am I going too fast for anybody? I'm going too fast for the whole Christian world, I'll tell you that. Going way too fast. Oh, the love of man. You can't, you, you can't take it in this body. Well, it's true, but you know this, this idea that this is the God who's torturing all of humanity is just, it's just insane. I thought I got to get out and witness and take everybody last and take every last breath I have to go tell the world about Jesus. Of course, I published a couple million books first, and then we're going to go to Paris, and I'll decide where I'll go from there. And he said, tell them, tell them I'm coming very, very soon. And he said it again, tell them I'm coming very, very soon. As we left, we went up above the earth's surface. We went above because we were still in the tunnel. So I couldn't see it anymore, but it was like a whirlwind. A giant whirlwind. Yeah, baby, you were not in Kansas anymore. We kept going up. We had to go up to get out of the to get out of it apparently. When we got to the top of it, I looked down to the earth and and we were so high and the curvature of the earth was like that. I I it's awesome to look back at the earth. I know God allowed that for me. He could have left that tunnel any which way he wanted. He knew in my heart as a kid I always wanted to see what the earth looked like from space. Maybe I watched too much Star Trek or something, you know. Yeah, I'm beginning to think maybe not only did he watch too much Star Trek, he actually believed what he saw on Star Trek. And it gave him a bad dream. But I don't believe he dreamed what he said. I just don't believe it. You couldn't make me believe it. I don't know how you could make me believe it. First of all, he contradicts himself all over the place. So which was the real dream? You see? No, he said it wasn't a dream. He said it was an out-of-body experience. It wasn't even a vision. Out-of-body experience. Anyway, we came back down. We passed through the shields. Did you hear that? We passed, coming back from outer space there, you know, we came through the shields. I knew we were passing through the heat shield that was around the earth. He did watch too much Star Trek. (laughs) I just knew it. I even thought, stupid thought, here I am with God, and I, I thought, quote, I wonder how he's going to get through that shield. You know how in space they have to penetrate at just a perfect angle. (laughs) I'm not lying. It's it's in the book. At the right angle. We went through it with no problem whatsoever. No surprise. I'm sure the Lord must have rolled his eyes and said, I can handle that one. And there's a scripture on that. You know, with them coming back through the shield, the the heat shield of the earth. He got a scripture. Oh, yes, he does. No, don't laugh. He got a scripture on that. It's Psalm 47, 9. Here's what it says. For the shields of the earth belong to God. Now, there it is. Now, there's scriptural proof. And here's a man who doesn't take scriptures out of context either. Much. Not. Then he says, I... Came down, we came over my we came over California and I saw my house and then I saw my body through the house. He said he could see it. Right then, he left. Okay, so he brought him back to the house. Okay, and and, and he knew for sure. He said, I, "This is my body. That can't be my body. How can I have two bodies? I have this body and there's my body in the house. You know." And and then right then, 
when he left, that's when all the fear, the torture, and the torment came back into my mind. Because it says in the Bible, perfect love casts out fear, 1 John 4.18. So I was next to perfect love at that time. See, I was next to Christ, who's perfect love, and it cast out all fear. But now he left, see? And now the fear is coming back. So uh, that he left me. And when he left, all of a sudden, all the fear and the horrors of hell entered my mind. I couldn't stand it. I couldn't stand it. I was screaming. I was in agony. I couldn't live with it. I knew my body was not capable of withstanding that kind of fear. You can't hold up under that kind of pressure. You can't, you're not strong enough. So that's when I prayed. And I was able to pray. Take it out of my mind. That's what he prayed. In the natural, you would you could not go through that kind of... You'd have to go through all kinds of counseling to get through this kind of trauma. But God took it out, instantly took it out, the trauma. He left the memory, but He took the trauma and the fear out. I was so grateful. What? Didn't we just read when his wife found it? He was filled with trauma, screaming, filled with trauma, so traumatized, so filled with trauma, so screaming and filled with terror and trauma. Didn't we just read? Didn't she tell us that? God took it away. And this is before his wife got there. He took it away and I was so grateful. And how did his wife find him? Screaming in trauma. This lying turkey. That's enough. You know what? I'm through. Thank you. That is so disgusting. I mean, that really is disgusting. That is just so pathetic. It's just unreal. Thank God that we have a little bit of a glimpse of what the scriptures are all about.